Hello everyone and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Zelf and SilverCloud. Just a few housekeeping items to go over. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion, and we will get to those at the end. Afterwards, stay on for expert mixologists Natasha and Rich. The husband and wife duo will be shaking things up with a refreshing mocktail and cocktail demonstration. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator, who joins us from Zelf, Mike McSherry. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Mike McSherry. I'm the CEO of Zelf, and I'm here to discuss COVID's other wave, uh, the mental health challenges that exist. Uh, we're all familiar and aware with, with the, the physical uh, diseases and, and challenges that COVID has brought and wrecked upon this nation but it has also brought social isolation. It's brought uh, a number of anxiety and stress and the economic uncertainty with the unemployment situation and uh, the challenges of going out and, and facing uh, life in, in a new normal, wearing masks and, and other uh, social distancing measures. We're being introduced to a range of, of new solutions in, in society and how we challenge this. And uh, there are a range of different tools and therapeutics that can help address this. And that's what we're here to discuss today. I'm with Zelf. It's, the, uh, it's a uh, platform that allows clinicians to prescribe digital tools to patients. And those tools can be content assets, articles, videos, apps uh, related to maternity care, behavioral health, diabetes management, devices to monitor uh, you know, patients' uh, uh, clinicals and vitals, as well as services such as meal delivery or transportation or, or e-commerce product recommendations. Uh, over the years, we've been working with Freighter and Medical College of Wisconsin and Silver Cloud to bring a digital health uh, solution specifically addre to address the mental health needs for this country and, and the patients that, that need uh, access to tools. In light of the whole COVID response and the, and the shutdown of you know, clinical visits and procedures, digital and virtual has come to the forefront. So that's what we're here to discuss today. I was notified just in front of this session that over 500 registrants uh, signed up to listen to this panel, so, which is 10x the volume of what they've seen in some other sessions. So there's obviously significant interest here, and we're here to learn about the solutions opportunities and, and future state of, of bringing digital health tools to a broader set of, of Americans as we deal with these challenges. So I'm joined with Dr. Brad Crotty from Freightert, uh, from Karen Tierney from Silver Cloud, and from Divya Palwal from Horizon Blue Cross uh, Blue Shield of New Jersey. So with that, I'm going to let each one of them introduce themselves, provide a couple minute background of themselves and their company, and then we'll get into the session. Um, Karen, would you like to start? Sorry, you caught me on the hop there. So hi, everybody. I am the co-founder and chief product officer of SilverCloud. I have a background in the humanities and creative arts, as well as biomedical science and health technology research. So I've been spent the last 12 years building psychosocial interventions in both oncology and mental health settings. And I hold responsibility for the product, ensuring it's fit for purpose, meeting customer, clinician, patient requirements. Um, through delivering kind of outcomes and engagement that are on par with um, traditional methods of care. So a little bit about SilverCloud um, more specifically. So SilverCloud enables the delivery of clinically validated digital mental health treatment or in therapeutic care. And it's also care that will um, increase access uh, and scale through digital delivery. It also reduces costs and has outcomes that are, would be on par with, with kind of face-to-face -face or more traditional methods of care. We're based on over 17 years of clinical research with leading academic institutions. And in fact, you know, a quarter of the company today continues to be engaged in research. We use by over 300 organizations globally uh, to meet their population's mental health needs. Uh, the platform has been validated through full randomized control trials and also real world data from over 475,000 uh, silver cloud users. Um, so, yeah, I, I, we have been working with um, Freider and Zelf for the last couple of years. And um, so kind of really kind of honored to do that. And I suppose, um, you know, when we work with somebody, we, it's, it's a deep partnership. You know, we, we make it work. We, we sit down, we, we break things apart. We put them back together again to make sure that um, success is on the table for everybody. So we're really passionate about that. And we feel like that's been reflected in a 
a kind of we've had a practically zero churn in customers over the last 10 years um, because of this approach which has worked really well and in fact a recent round of series b funding has been made up of a syndicate of existing partner health organizations so really proud of that great thank you uh divya Hear me? Yep. I serve as the Chief Clinical Transformation Officer at Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. In that role, I oversee the value based. That we do. Divya, you, you appear to be um, stuttering in, in the uh, video transmission. Okay. Should I should I repeat uh, myself? Yes, please. Okay. Can you hear me better now? Yes. All right. Hello, everyone. This is Divya Paliwal. I serve as the Chief Clinical Transformation Officer at Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. In that role, I oversee the value-based and clinical transformation work that we do across our provider partner base. And I'm a primary care physician by background. Great. Brad? Uh, good morning or afternoon, everyone, depending on your time zone. Uh, my name is Brad Crotty. I, um, work at Freighter at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Um, I serve as the Chief Digital Engagement Officer. We are a academic uh, health system, academic community health system of um, uh, three uh, hospitals, uh, about uh, uh, 30 to, to 40 um, uh, community health centers um, in, the, in, our, in our region of Southeastern Wisconsin. Um, and we have been um, both partner, partners with both uh, Silver Cloud and, and Zells over the last number of uh, years. Um, great. Thanks. Perhaps Thanks. I can just. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dr. Crotty. So we've been working with, with, uh, with Freightert uh, in delivering a solution to a, a broad set of your patients. Um, Zelt prescribes tools for behavioral health, for hypertension, for patient education, and uh, in mental health, uh, of which there's a huge preponderance. As we've been working with you in Silver Cloud, uh, we recently published a, a case study and an uh, article about the benefits of the solution in, in meeting your patient needs in, in mental health and mental illness. illness. Uh, would you like to talk about some of the data and, and benefits that's been uh, defined for your patients from that? And then, Karen, I'd like for you to specifically talk about which patient population Silver Cloud addresses. I mean, I've seen data that shows, you know, 20 to 25 percent of, of people in America have some form of mental illness or, or, or mental health condition, uh, whereas Silver Cloud targets a, a more discrete set of, of patients. So, you know, let's have some of that data and then let's discuss specifically the audience population that Silver Cloud aims to address. Sure. Well, let me um, rewind a little bit. Um, we'll, I know, eventually talk about, you know, the, the challenging times that we're going through right now, but we really started our digital mental health work uh, it, actually um, three years ago, almost, uh, almost to the day. Uh, today, so it was in, in 2017, and you know the problem that we were were trying to solve is probably something that many health systems were trying to solve is that we were rolling out um, and trying to do a better job about screening for depression. Depression is a condition that is um, often under under diagnosed, or put it put another way, more people um, struggle or suffer with some form of depression or anxiety than they necessarily are willing or, or, or do, do patients and clinicians really have time to address and manage, particularly in, in busy primary care visits. And so as we rolled out our depression screening program, we wanted to make sure that we had a, a scalable uh, solution that we could offer our 
uh, primary care cl clinicians who uh, would be left with a a um, a summary or a, a positive screen that they needed to to help the person with, but now's the well, the, the now what um, and and so that now what uh, we looked at the digital tools in addition to you know our other access points for behavioral health within our system. But what was appealing about a digital tool is it would be very very scalable and it could be something that could be more rapidly incorporated into to people's um, lives. And we really looked at the the you know the silver cloud, the digital mental health tool as um, you know, serving a couple of different roles. It could be, um, you know, primary uh, treatment for someone who just wants a little bit of um, sort of the internet CBT. I just want to sort of do this um, on my own. It could be used as an adjunct therapy, uh, meaning that several of our folks who get, who we refer um, over to uh, behavioral health will also use this as um, some self-work um, in between visits and then um, and it could be a bridge between um, the primary care and getting to um, behavioral health. So we've been running this now for you know, a, number, uh, a number of years, enrolled uh, a couple of thousand patients uh, in, the, in the program. Um, it is a, a digital enrollment, so it's done within the, the flow of the electronic health record. Uh, can be a discussion at the point of care, um, a recommendation made, and then a, an online enrollment uh, done through the electronic health record um, through our through our tools. So we've enrolled, um, you know, a couple of a couple of thousand people. I think you know, like twenty four hundred or, or or so, just you know, kind of within our primary care over uh, last year's, and we prescribed it to to more. And sort of, you know, what we found is about half the folks will go and fill, I, I sort of call it filling the prescription. Um, uh, but, but it's interesting, like when you actually get into the folks who have more moderate depression, the, the fill rate is really around 65% um, uh, roughly. So certainly not everyone does it, but certainly a majority of people will, will do. And what we're finding is sort of people in that, you know, moderate depression category, um, you know, three fourths of them will show some clinical um, improvement. Really, is uh, put forth by a you know a follow up PHQ nine, which is our um, our standard uh, outcome measure that we whether we use as sort of a nine question instrument, and people decrease. And as we look at across, this is both for anxiety and depression. If you look at across all the different ranges, we see uh, generally people. Um, decreasing uh, all of their scores down. So the curve sort of shifts from sort of moderate uh, stress, anxiety, more to much more mild um, or, or, um, or more negligible stress, anxiety. Of course, some, not everyone gets better, right? So this is, um, you know, d depression and anxiety are complex. This is one facet of of treatment. Um, what's nice about the program that, that we have is that we also have uh, a supporter who um, looks in and engages with folks on the back end and they're able to look at and escalate um, folks who are kind of have a trajectory of not doing as well and then we make sure that we uh, meet their needs in other adjunctive ways, whether it's sort of an expedited uh, behavioral health appointment or sort of following back with their uh, prescribers to let them know what uh, what's been uh, what's been going on. So we've seen those uh, with with anxiety. I sort of was mentioning depression with anxiety. We've also seen uh, you know uh, good where you know over the half of, over half of folks are showing you know really significant improvement. And again, what's nice about it is it's able to be done either as a adjunct to other forms of care or I many people are are doing it on their own. So roughly two thirds of patients are, are actually enrolling in when it's been recommended by the doctor and an even higher percentage are, are showing signs of improvement. Um, you know, to, to Karen, I know that we've worked with you at, across uh, several different systems. Uh, are, are you seeing the same level of adoption rates at other systems? And are, are you addressing the broadest population base against you know, mental health needs or are you segmenting a very specific uh, 
group with, with your solution and your capabilities? So what we would typically do actually is to sit down with, with, with our, with, um, you know, with our customers and with clinicians and understand the populations that they want to reach because the system has the capacity to kind of segment and work in a number of different ways. Um, as Dr. Crotty was saying, you know, it can be a bridge to care or a bridge out of care, an adjunct face-to-face, uh, -face, you know, an adjunct face-to-face -face waitlist management or by itself. So it's really about understanding about what the provider themselves, what, what kind of success looks like for them. Um, I would say typically, um, I'd say the, the broadest kind of population that we would have through the platform would have a kind of mild to moderate depression and anxiety. That's certainly a sweet spot for kind of online kind of therapy in general. And um, we have also kind of demonstrated in trials as well as, you know, um, in real world, you know, the benefits for people who might be subclinical, you know, in, in terms of like building their own resilience and so forth. And equally on the other side of the spectrum, we've seen um, it used successfully for severe patients. And, um, and I suppose like at the moment, one of the really interesting things about COVID has been the acceleration of the adoption of digital mental health. And for us, what we've seen is a new willingness to bring us into new populations uh, where previously, you know, it, we just would not have had access to otherwise. And I suppose because it's, it's been, you know, having that kind of sudden switch to, um, you know, to, to going virtual. So it's how do you maintain continuity of care? So while most of our populations would come through primary care referrals, um, we would also now be looking at use cases within inpatient settings, partial hospitalization programs, and also maybe um, around populations that would have more sejour um, severe and enduring kind of mental illness as well, um, and also pediatrics. So it's, it's, been, it's been quite interesting. So we, we are seeing the breadth of the populations that we reach expand um yeah particularly in recent times that, that's great uh brad referenced something earlier and maybe you could help educate the, the audience here he referenced cbt can you uh can you define that and the role that that plays in, in digital therapeutics yeah certainly so cbt is cognitive behavioral therapy it looks at how your thoughts feelings and behaviors are linked and what works really well about cbt is that it was a manualized kind of therapy in that you know it kind of follows a specific structure and um, and when you're when you are um in a you know sitting down with a therapist face to face you're not necessarily going to know that you're doing cbt because they're maybe pulling the the, the different kind of protocols and working you know, them with you but when you are doing um when you were doing online CBT, it's, it's just there's a really kind of structured approach and it's kind of very clear about what bit relates to what part. So say in depression, you'll have something like behavioral activation in which you're helping people to kind of, you know, get motivated or start doing either the things they, they need to do to look after themselves or to do the things they might have stopped doing because of their depressions they used to enjoy. Um, and so it's just something that works really well on online and that, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's there, we you know we deliver it via content in various kind of forms of media, videos, animations, and so forth. Um, and then you're providing people with tools um, that they can interact with and you're giving them kind of case studies or personal stories. So you're always building on kind of concrete examples and you're helping them to kind of, um, to, to apply it in their daily lives. Like the whole kind of premise of the platform is around um, helping people to develop a level of like a, a level of self-awareness and to kind of self-reflect on maybe what might be causing you know might be triggering for them and then once that kind of level of self-awareness is raised and you can do that you say using tools like the, like the mood monitor um, and we have we have kind of other more self-reflective maybe more journal type entries in which people can explore certain difficult aspects and then once people have achieved a level of that or starting to build that then you, you kind of build in self-management as well because you know we're not out to create you know users that are on the platform forever cbt is a short solution focused therapy and you really want to to basically skill people up and um, so that when they finish the therapy they have they have the skills and uh, strategies that they need to manage their triggers and so when they go back you know they go out into the world as it were you know maybe the first time they hit a trigger you know it was it, it kind of felt like a bit falling off a cliff but they pulled themselves out of it but maybe because you can't you can't um you know you're you're never going to be able to sit down and make a list of all your triggers work them out in therapy and move on 
So then when you are, when you're back out into the real world and you hit another trigger, it's uh, because you have that the skills and toolkit there and you know what you need to do to kind of bring yourself back up. It's kind of less like falling off a cliff and more like stepping into a puddle. Sorry, I could talk about that all day. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I'd rather step in a puddle than fall off a cliff. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, nice Agreed. analogy. It, it must come from the, the Irish in you. Um, <laughs> And so it's not just uh, you know recommending someone to walk down to the pub and uh, meet the mates. Uh, no, so, so Divya, uh, you know, to the payer perspective here, uh, you know, you're, the payers are the ones that often define a covered benefit and what they'll reimburse for. And you know, in this case, Freighter, you know, felt the need that they need to address a, a looming challenge amongst their patient population and, and to provide you know digital health tools for for mental health uh, to their patients to help scale their, their doctors is, is what Brad said. So on the payer side, you know, the, this webinar started actually with, with a picture of a beach. Sure, that's emotional well-being. You know, why don't you reimburse for a, you know, for a beach vacation and that would make me feel good. Uh, how do you define what is a covered benefit and where do you see digital therapeutics and, and especially mental health tools falling into a covered benefit versus what has traditionally been face-to-face -face therapy sessions and, and defining the clinical need, you know, based upon that face-to-face -face assessment? Yeah, w one thing that, that has emerged increasingly, Mike, and, and especially with COVID-19, right, is that to meet the multiple needs that our populations, our communities have, right, we have to be able to to, to meet those needs via multiple channels, right? And that's a combination of both brick and mortar settings as well as virtual settings. So our behavioral health team um, already, and, and, and this journey started a number of years ago, um, engaged with multiple platforms to solve for those varying behavioral health needs um, of the communities that we serve. Some of those interact directly with the members. So, so the example that, that Karen said of, uh, of CBT, which is self-directed, uh, while several others are, are, are tightly integrated with uh, and driven by our provider partners. Um, and, and, and so with that, you know, a, a, a couple of factors that, that we've seen drive up, the, drive up the adoption rates, because ultimately the outcomes that get served by any of those channels, whether virtual or face-to-face, -face, in terms of meeting the needs of the populations is what drives um, their, their availability and their reimbursement, right? Um, so so, so to, to be able to drive those adoption rates, um, first, one thing that we have seen to succeed is where there is integration with providers, how do you take it to the physician practice level to understand their workflows and customize um, to, to what will work is important. So to, so to give you an example, um, about a couple of years ago, we launched this virtual collaborative care um, model where um, driven by primary care practices, they, we implemented a, 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 an, an algorithm that would help identify individuals with unmet behavioral health needs and then connect them to behavioral health uh, providers. Um, and when we took this to one of our primary care practices that, that has been extremely clinically mature um, and has implemented its own virtual behavioral health care coordination system, you know, the, the response that we got from them is, we do not want this, this platform to be directly available within our practices. We instead want it to serve as an overflow to whatever needs cannot be met by our, by our already integrated behavioral health team. Right. So understanding the nuances and how exactly any of the solutions fit within the overall structure of care that is provided to the members is extremely critical to us in terms of what gets covered versus not. Um, and, and then the second thing that, that, that I, would, I would just like to emphasize is, you know, a, a lot of the solutions that we see today uh, solve for very niche problems 
within the overall continuum of care uh, in behavioral health. And that is, that is okay because we need them to be really good with what they do. That said, we then need to bring these solutions together, orchestrate them, them in an ecosystem such that they complement each other, they talk to each other and, and grow each other. And so I think those are some of the factors that we have seen to drive not only adoption rates, but also how we bring certain solutions in as covered benefits. Okay, so Divya, I, I, I saw on Wikipedia, so I know it must be true, that, that you guys <laughs> have uh, a little over 3 million covered lives. Would you know how many, uh, what percentage of, of those lives get some sort of mental health treatment or programs or reimbursement? And, and then what percentage of that is digitally met versus you know, face-to-face -face brick and mortar or medications or other traditional therapeutic um, you know, kind of support? Yeah, so we have, uh, so, 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 the, so the part of uh, over 3 million membership is true. We have close to 3.6 million members today uh, across the state of New Jersey. And depending upon which, which population it is, whether, whether those are employer-based accounts or those are our Medicaid members or our Medicare Advantage members, there are, there are varying solutions that meet those needs. Both, obviously, there's, we have an expansive network of behavioral health uh, physicians as well as facilities that serve the, this membership. But outside of that, we have made investments in multiple solutions, um, ranging from those that cater to, to the, the, uh, those with mild acuities all the way to, to severe mental illness as well as substance use disorders. And based on where those populations serve, we have solutions targeted to each. Okay, not silver clad? You just heard the amazing stats they're getting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great, so mm -hmm. you, al you also referenced something about, about workflow integration and the, and the payer provider collaboration. Uh, Dr. Crotty, wh where do you see that, that sitting, the, the necessity of workflow integration of, of these digital therapeutics and, and your relationship with the payers to help subsidize to offer it to a broad set of, of patients as a covered benefit? Yeah, no, a great, a great question. So, you know, when it comes to workflow, I think, you know, the, the comments were, were spot on for this to be really adopted and be, I mean, it's also adopted by the, by the patients too, um, you know, given the choice between uh, having something that is part of a broader uh, care strategy uh, or something that is more standalone. I think what we've seen in a number of uh, digital uh, studies and research that having something connected and being, you know, having a, a human on the other end as opposed to being just purely technology um, does improve adoption. So it's 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 not different here. Um, where we in, you know focus on um, you know uh, the workflow integration for a tool that. That it's sort of individual, you know, that an individual does on their own at, at home is sort of in two locations. One is we do it at the point of um, sort of recommendation um, and discussion. And so by putting into the workflow of screening for depression, we can identify uh, patients who meet that criteria. We can use our decision support tools to then recommend services um, like the like digital and like uh, Silver Cloud in particular around ranges of, of scores. And then the other piece of it is, well, that, that how, how are, are they doing with it um, within the, once we integrate into the electronic health record, um, we can then go back and have conversations to say, well, I see that you're getting better or I see that you're getting worse over the last week or two, um, can we talk about that? And so whether it's at a, at a visit or whether it's something that gets, that gets escalated, um, that connectivity helps enable those, those conversations, um, which we think makes a more, you know, makes a more meaningful um, experience, not to say that it's not a, you know, a good experience on, on their own, where we are increasingly interested in tools that exactly can free up or sort of help uh, level load uh, where in-person providers are. But I think that that workflow discussion, you know, that workflow connection is 
important um, on both the, the ordering and the and the monitoring and and where it comes to 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 payers one of the challenges that I think we have as a, speaking for a a health system but I think that is not unique to us is that when you have services that are particularly only covered under certain contracts it becomes very difficult to know at the point of prescribing um, you, this is going to be covered for you, but this is not going to be covered for you, or I can't prescribe this, or I can't prescribe it. And even if we do maintain the logic and the insurance updates and the eligibility files and provide that into decision support, it still doesn't quite feel as, um, you know, as smooth or as natural in that recommendation because these sort of um, it seems like it's one of those to me one of those things that if you meet if you have a criteria that you meet where where this can be of help help to you we should just be able to do it regardless of pair Dad. so that's the um that's the approach that that we have uh that we have taken thanks Charlie. um you know and when it comes to working with the pairs uh we have prepped for a lot of this in the sort of value-based care world, although clearly we are, you know, not, we're still in this very mixed fee-for-service um, value-based uh, world. Um, and so we have taken the approach of being payer agnostic and providing the service to, to meet the need, although we have gone back to um, and started discussions with some of our larger payers to see how these digital tools fit into um, some of our contracts. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the challenges of, of U.S. healthcare is sometimes uh, they're consumer paid kind of OTC level efforts. Uh, sometimes they're hospital provided services and then sometimes they're payer covered services. Karen, you know, we, we watch TV, we see LeBron James, we see Michael Phelps talking about talk space and calm and, you know, they've raised, you know, gazoodles of money and and they're kind of a direct to consumer app in the app store. And sometimes it's like stress or anxiety or mental focus or self-actualization. Um, you know, I know that you guys were talking about being doctor prescribed. So it's against a clinical condition that, that I presume has a higher level of bar of, of, of need. Um, and, and, you know, can you discuss the, the different uh, market segments and, and where like talk space and calm might, might be relevant and then where you guys are relevant. And, and then I've got a follow on question as well. Some of the, the Q and A's from the audience address whether or not silver cloud is, is targeted at doctor systems prescribing or insurance companies referring their members to, or whether there's a, a employer based or direct to consumer based offering for your service. Hmm making notes there yeah and um, so I suppose we yeah just from the very beginning I mean we, we come from a research background and so we're always incredibly focused on efficacy and outcomes and that's what we deliver on we're not looking to um, as I say kind of have long-term users you know with on a subscription model that's not how we work um, and we were really looking also to solve the problem around you know the shortage of clinicians a lot of, you know, um, you know, people that would be seen in the same space of us have essentially replicated face to face care in a virtual environment. And what we were looking to do is see how we could extend, you know, clinicians uh, capacity because, you know, everybody knows the shortage of mental health professionals in the US, you know, 60% of, you know, counties don't have any mental health professionals, you know, 40% of therapists are reaching retirement age in the next four years, like it's horrendous and there's less and less you know, therapists graduating every year. So we're like, well, how, how can we deliver care that's kind of one to many? And so what we basically did was we built our, our kind of the coach that's in the loop for us. It's like, it, we call it the asynchronous model. So asynchronous means it's not real time. So basically your coach will log in, they'll, they can kind of review what you've done um, and they'll, they'll leave you a message and you'll know when you, and you'll, you'll, A, you'll know when to expect that message and B, you'll get an email to say that the message is there. And what we see, and, and just to say that the, the, the treatment, the intervention is actually the program itself and that the coach is really there to kind of motivate and drive engagement. They're there to answer questions and they're there to uh, maybe signpost you to particular content and also to, um, to uh, maybe unlock additional content to personalize treatment for you. So they're kind of with you on your journey 
um, but they are not, you know, you, you are in the driving seat as it were. So what we found is that when when supporters or coaches are used to to leaving reviews on silver cloud that they can support between six and ten people an hour so um if you so you can if you just do the maths there you're just you're extending care you know by by huge factors and given you know the increasing demand and awareness and the decreasing supply and um, so we were just very much focused on um on, on doing that and also ensuring that the outcomes that we deliver were on par with face to face. This efficacy is always in core to what we do. So we're also really mindful that we are first and foremost a technology company. So with that in mind, we, we don't necessarily want to, to, to build out a huge kind of, we, we don't want to be a, a healthcare system. So really it's like, well, how do we plug in and how can we, how can we enhance and augment existing care pathways? So with that, we really kind of focus on working more specifically with, with kind of healthcare providers. You know, often there are people there already, um, you know, LCSWs, you know, there, that, that there are people who can who can uh, work on Silver Cloud. They don't have to be like full time coaches on Silver Cloud. It can just be part of their their kind of uh, their workflow, as it were. And so kind of bearing that in mind, you know, other things that kind of fell out of that was how important interoperability was, you know, reducing kind of clinician burden um, and because ultimately it's all about the sustainability of the solution there's nothing more annoying than bringing in you know everybody experiences you know it says use this technology use the technology and then you you know it falls by the wayside and it's just it's game over so it's like how do we make sure that this is like a living breathing part of treatment care pathways so with that in mind it was very much it was it was much less about the d to c i'm not saying we'll never they'll never explore that path because like the company mission is you know, having, you know, mental health, access to mental health care for everybody. So it's not maybe something um, I would shut the door on right now, but definitely our primary focus is on, you know, working with, you know, in partner, partnering with, with kind of customers. So it would be a lot of the kind of doctor systems. We would also work with payers as well, absolutely, and, and, and employers as well. Um, and in fact, what we've seen more recently is healthcare providers applying Silver Cloud within their own, um, to, you know, within, within their own kind of staff as well, their own, their own team. And we've just had some really interesting kind of feedback from that. We've seen one healthcare system and they saw um, utilization rates of 15%. Um, versus a typical say EAT access rate of four percent, and so and that was so that was two thousand uh, healthcare um, you know uh, staff, and essentially when they were kind of polled afterwards, sixty percent of them said they would not otherwise have ac have accessed or sought treatment. So just they're just on a path to burnout, or they might have left the organisation. So you're seeing kind of a potential real term retention of well the twelve hundred staff in that case. And in a, another one we're hoping to, um, yeah, that we're kind of working with at the moment, they've actually seen a direct ROI saving of $17 for every $1 spent on Silver Cloud. And that was on a, um, like a, a sample that was like a 1,100 employees in one year. Okay, that, that's great. Um, how, how do you actually measure the outcomes? Like when, when someone has improved through the, yeah. the, you know, their time bound, you know, session and, and therapy, you say you want to give them self help skills. How, how do you measure that outcome improvement? So it's the same way that it's done in face to face care, essentially, um, patients are asked to fill in um, these, these kind of uh, really well um, research and validated measures called they're just called their clinical questionnaires um, we would use uh, the PHQ-9 the patient health questionnaire 9 for uh, depression and then the GAD-7 generalized anxiety disorder um, questionnaire for for anxiety so um, and they do they say in the chain it's nine questions and seven questions so they fill them in and so maybe the first time um, that they fill them in that that's their baseline score and so that's that's how you know so you know if you're if you're from zero to five you're subclinical but maybe if you're like 18 and above you, you're maybe severe and so this, they're kind of like a that, that that's kind of how people are graded in terms of the levels of anxiety and depression that they're experiencing and so essentially um as you attend therapy in a face-to-face -face setting you, you fill them in again and it's the same on the platform as well so um, we would have we would have the patients fill in these questionnaires at what you know at specified intervals, so that you can track somebody's progress over time. And you know often it's like you know once um, once the patient has maybe reached that subclinical threshold, that's when they're they're maybe they're, they would be deemed to be recovered. 
Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot. Not now. You're going to have to answer this by the end. But you said if you go DTC, uh, you're going to have to come up with a corporate spokesperson. You know, one's chosen LeBron, one's chosen Michael Phelps. I know Ken, your, your CEO and co-founder is, I don't know, probably 6'8 himself. So he, he's in that tall camp. and six nine, he's actually. The, he's 6'9". Six uh, six nine. Nine. So yeah. potentially he, he's, he's the spokesperson tall to be a pilot. Uh, for yeah. you. But, <laughs> but by the end, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask uh, who, who's going to be the famous celebrity that would uh, represent you guys in the market well. So. Uh, you can come back and think about that. Uh, yeah. Do Dr. Crotty, as, as we are uh, thinking about, you know, COVID and, and, you know, we've been working with, with you in Silver Cloud for a couple of years, you know, obviously there's been a mental health need in, in the community for a, a long while. What specifically have you seen change or, or enhance or increase and is the volume of patients being uh, prescribed silver cloud increased exponentially or marginally or, or stayed static within your community? We've seen increases in growth in terms of the number of folks who are using it as well as their engagement in the tool. And so, you know, several of the, 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 the challenges that people are running into are, of course, isolation uh, with with several of the, um, you know, the, the need to, to uh, physical distance and, and, and stay um, at distance from others. Um, there are uh, folks who are certainly in, you know, employment, uh, employment uh, challenges or, and, and, or being laid, laid off uh, for the first time. And so there's a, certainly a, a lot bubbling up now. Um, and and there's also just like a general anxiety around um, the illness, the illness itself. And so, if we look at like our quarter over quarter uh, growth, we we've really doubled it um, over the last um, really sort of a you know March um, into into the end of June. We've doubled our rate of of prescriptions in this. So it not quite exponentially, but it is it is it is growing. Um, you know, an area um, that I think is is important to note is that we also have a remote monitoring pathway for folks who at our are at our health system and um, and test positive for um, SARS-CoV-2, and we we do have a remote monitoring um, uh, program uh, that engages them to to check in and see how folks are are doing and progressing over time. Several of the uh, feedback that our nurses are getting are really around anxiety, and so that has been yet another referral source into the program, you know, as a complement to other work that we're doing with uh, patient report outcomes, uh, pulse oximetry, and then sort of managing the anxiety and the, the behavioral health around that is it's also really um, not small. And so we we have been working in. Uh, and integrating in the silver cloud uh, piece with that. You know, I think one of the, the things our supporters have noted is that the engagement seems to be a little bit more, more robust. Um, you know, a general, uh, you know, quick look at that is the amount of time and the amount of words that people are, um, sort of amount of time that people are engaging or if they do write a note to the supporter, the length of those notes, the number of words in that note uh, back and forth um, are, is increasing. So um, both, yeah, in terms of actual numbers as well as engagement, it seems to be increasing. Yeah, so, I mean, you referenced kind of several things that sort of just broadly encompass virtual care. Uh, you know, prescribing apps and therapies and online wellness coaching to patients, which bridges into telehealth. You talked about remote patient monitoring and bringing that data back into the clinicians to review and, and, and take corrective action if necessary to the patients. It, you know, obviously we've, we've seen all the news that this is the, the new world order, the new pa path to care delivery. What percentage of, of care do you see being addressed digitally in the future, via telehealth and, and remote care options against specific disease management and, and RPM, remote patient monitoring, you know, to help the, the telehealth support uh, in, in providing relevant uh, direction and care treatment options to patients? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, just a little bit of numbers to 
kind of ground what we've seen with with outpatient um, around the the pandemic. We've you know had swings as much as seventy percent of care uh, being provided uh, through um, virtual means, whether it's telephone um, or video. And most of those were were video, but in the earlier days there was a, a mix of telephone is in, in there as well. Um, but once you add on, so if you add on portal and, you know, portal enrollment and engagement, um, which is not, not as high as we you know, think it will grow to yet. And some of that may be still the limited value proposition, but if you sort of go to 50, then you add on um, some sort of digital health tool or digital I, I think you'll get to around, um, you know, sort of a goal of around 70% of folks to be have some sort of digital engagement or some sort of digital um, program as part of their of their care. And I think that will continue to rise um, rise over time. If we look at just you know the opportunity, you know, even um, you know, we have internet internet rates of 90 plus percent above in in households um, and even among the um, you know, the digital divide is, is quite real, um, though the, even at the lowest of the SES um, classes, it's still around 89% based on Pew data. So those gaps are closing and that provides an opportunity to continue to engage, um, particularly meet er areas where, well, well now kind of uh, there's a, a still a, a desire to try to deliver as much care remotely. Um, but um, it also solves issues of transportation. It solves issues of time away from work. And we've had a couple of really cool success stories of people doing, you know, smoking cessation uh, visits and counseling while on smoke breaks at work. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's much more able to fit into the lives of, of people rather than these sort of like episodic um, visits where you have to get it kind of everything done in, in six months. And so I think as, so I think around 70%, but it may grow even as, as our trends change. Okay. Divya, you, uh, you know, I, I heard uh, Karen reference, uh, I forget, five to one, six to one kind of therapist to, to patient kind of uh, ability to ha handle, uh, you know, addressing. So sort of the multiplexing of, of resources, which you know, presumably is cost uh, reducing and, and providing care. And, you know, from the payer angle, you're, you're looking to see how you can cut, cut costs of care delivery. Is this the tipping point where you recommend or incent or demand that your members start with a digital first kind of solution? Uh, and, you know, it could be in behavioral health, but, but more broadly. Uh, and, where are you seeing the, the cost reduction benefits of providing digital tools and, and you know, certainly with the focus on mental health? Yeah, uh, good, good question, Mike. And, and, and I want to share a couple of statistics that uh, from our end, and uh, those are not uh, too dissimilar to what uh, Brad mentioned in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the numbers that they are seeing. So in February, 2020, right before uh, COVID-19 uh, hit us, we were seeing a total of about 12,000 claims related to telehealth. In April, 2020, that number shot up to over 700,000. That's about a 6,000% increase, right? And if, and if we break those numbers down to a diagnosis basis, behavioral health diagnosis, for by far the majority, almost a three to one compared to other diagnoses, with anxiety being being the top driver there, right? Now, the, the those peaks obviously have have matured and they've lowered over the over the last few months, right? But it does demonstrate to us the implications of 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 COVID-19 on us uh, broadly as a society, as well as on healthcare delivery, right? And, and what we saw in the, in, in the image at aftermath was, it was an either or, right? 70 to 80% of, of visits or interactions shifted to a telephonic or a video-based 
setting. And before that, it was mostly face-to-face. -face. I think where we will increasingly be getting to is an and, right? So it's not you have to do digital or you have to do face-to-face. -face. It is how do we blend those digital, virtual, as well as brick and mortar, ch mortar channels together to make sure that the needs of the patients are effectively being served, right? Now, again, there are certain there are certain conditions, there are certain populations where the digital channel lends itself to, to, uh, to easier use, to, to, uh, to more access. If that is the case, then, then absolutely, right? We, 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 are, we are driving growth in those digital, uh, on, the, on those digital platforms. Um, I don't see us getting to a stage where we will necessarily mandate, right? This is the way. Ultimately, it is driven by what, what works best for, for the members, meeting them where they are. And how do you integrate all of that with what our providers do and provider partners, how they serve the communities? Great, thanks. And, and you know, impressive stats in there. So I'm gonna start, uh, taking some of the audience questions. While, while this webinar has been going on, there've been a number of questions that have come in. Uh, a lot of them are focused around the, the direct employer and, and working from home and the increased responsibility and, and necessity of, of mental health needs. Uh, a lot of that has been addressed, but, but quite specifically, Karen, do you guys sell to employers at this point in time? Yes or no? Yes. All right. Uh, are there any big name brand employers that you reference as, as customers? Um, this is the kind of question Ken answers really well. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I can say we're not a big name, but I can say, you know, we, we have rolled it out from the employer side to, to staff as well as um, on the educational side to our students and, and learners and, and medical trainees. Um, so it, it's, it was sort of a, a natural ad for us to our employ, employers, employments. Yeah, I, I also know that uh, Zelf and, and Silver Cloud work together at Providence Health um, here in Seattle, and I'm based in Seattle. And, and uh, uh, a big focus of that is, is the increased mental health needs amongst caregivers. And, and Providence has 120,000 employees uh, nationwide, so there's a large percentage uh, amongst there. Um, there. There's a question about, uh, whether this is incorporated alongside medication or specific in, in individual. And, and you know, there's, a, there's a view to the emerging world of digital therapeutics that, that has kind of quote companion app. Uh, and I saw recently that Propeller, uh, which is focused on, on asthma, uh, you know, is now being prescribed in Europe alongside a medication as a joint bundle. Uh, Dr. Crotty, where do you see that kind of companion app alongside meds uh, you know, occurring in the future? Yeah, so where I break down, this is kind of my, the way I think about this, the way I explain it to, to folks around here is that we have medicines to help change um, some aspect of biology. We have medical devices to change some aspect of physiology. Um, what's missing from both of those, which is sort of the limit of what a lot of healthcare offers is sort of what do we have to help with behavior? Um, and that's where I think digital can really come in and play. And so that's where, you know, the companion can, can really help um, because it really requires, you know, some component of a combination of, of those three things to get to the health outcome that you want. And so, you know, we look at for, you know, behavioral health, this, you know, this tool in particular can be um, something that we use early for more mild uh, cases on its own. Um, or for people, because uh, I will see patients that will just say, I really don't want to, I'm not ready to take a medicine or I don't want to. And so we will use this here um, as sort of our initial um, strategy uh, care plan. But then um, people may need medicine on top of them. We certainly see again in our integrated behavioral health uh, programs that we have, this is almost a, sort of an, uh, an automatic um, you know, component to that care plan. And so you have some medication adjustment and titration, but then you have the behavior um, 
also that the person's engaging with the, the application or tool. And then there's a whole other range just you know, beyond mental health of where there's some aspect of behavior that um, is part of a care plan, whether it's asthma, whether it is um, in oncology, um, whether it's in um, cardiology, uh, any number of gastroenterology where there may be a medication plus a behavior that we need to adjust and the digital can help you know, uh, bridge those two, thing, two worlds. Okay, I'm probably gonna have uh, time for a single last question. And um, this probably goes to, uh, I'll do the one against reimbursement, uh, how telehealth is being reimbursed and uh, reimbursement for these digital therapeutics. So Divya, if you wanna you know, ad address uh, how patients seek reimbursement for you know, engaging in, in mental health and digital health needs. Yeah, so, so telehealth today um, is uh, ever since COVID-19 hit us has been, has been at, at parity in terms of reimbursement, right? So, so whether it's a face-to-face -face visit or whether our providers are, are attending to the needs of, of our populations via uh, telephonic or video visits, there is parity from a reimbursement perspective. Um, from, from a digital therapeutics perspective more broadly, um, it, it, it is a combination. Again, it depends upon, you know, from, from an insurance perspective, um, is, it, is it an employer-based um, account, right, member that, that we are serving versus, versus, um, versus not, right? And in the case of the former, obviously, our employers will need to, will need to buy in and, and agree to these uh, these uh, digital applications being prescribed, um, and and for the rest of the population, if there are outcomes that 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 drive, if there are access gap uh, needs that get met, uh, those become a part of the solutions that we provide to our members. Is is CMS reimbursing for any digital mental health needs? Directly, I'm not sure about that. Which poses a question against healthcare inequality. I mean, if, if you're on Medicare or Medicaid and you're forced to see face-to-face, -face, you know, doctor visits right now, that that's almost uh, in, inequality yeah. versus the digital. Oh, CMS for, for for now in, for telehealth, yes, they are. Yeah, in, in general, now that these these have all been um, relaxed in terms of what is um, covered during the public health um, emergency, especially for. Um, I mean, they, they have made codes available also for the, the visits, you know, the traditional visit, as, but as well as some uh, uh, patient monitoring um, solutions programs. Okay. Um, Karen, who, who's the celebrity that would represent you guys? I had to do some digging there. Would you believe we actually have a persona for our platform? And so I pull that out. So it's probably not what you're exactly looking for, but the kind of uh, how we visualize our platform is somebody like Dr. Watson, not Sherlock Holmes, is, or somebody <laughs> like Miss Honey in Matilda or like R2D2. So the kind of person that always comes to the rescue that you want on your team, but that you're the star of the show. So um, yeah, that's our criteria. Um, and that's kind of how we visualize what we do. Um, yeah. I, I yeah, no, no I, I like I like the avatar, you know, kind of reference. Uh, not not to mention Ken, you know, tall, good looking Irishman. <laughs> yeah, he, he represents well alongside LeBron and, uh, and, yeah, and Michael Phelps. Sure yeah, uh, yeah. He, he can thank yeah. me and pay me later for that comment. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I think I think we're at the top of the hour here, and uh, there have been a number of questions that that you know came in, obviously, and and I don't know that we're going to have uh, time to address them all. Uh, if we're able to still continue and participate, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, see about addressing them, you know, more broadly. I'm not sure of the exact cutoff here. Uh, most of them re refer to employer-based questions of reimbursement and accessibility, and, and I don't know if that's, you know, representative of the audience, you know, kind of questions or the needs out there in the, in the market. Um, oh, I'm seeing a, a little note that we can continue the conversation. 
Uh, I don't know about everyone else's. Uh, oh, continue the conversation on Twitter. So I apologize that I didn't have that. What I would like to do, uh, though, is thank, you know, certainly Dr. Crotty and, and, and Dr. Palawal and, and Karen for being on the front lines and, and providing, you know, care and needs and, and solutions to the, the market and to patients that, that obviously have a, a need. And, you know, we're all facing this as a as a country in, in a new world order, and, and you guys are on the front lines providing care, and we thank you for uh, addressing this this vast need in this country. So thank you, and I only think we're going to continue to see more and more digital tools and improvements and benefits scaling. So uh, we'll conclude on that. Thank you for your participation, everyone, and and thank you to Health for for hosting uh, this webinar. And we would have seen you guys face to face, you know, coming up here in the fall, but. That's been canceled in this new world reality. So let's all conclude and um, good luck and thank you for the care. Thank you to Mike and all of our panelists. If you'd like to join us in continuing the conversation, please join us on Twitter using the hashtag on the screen. Now I'd like to introduce our expert mixologists, Natasha and Rich. I'm a New York City based mixologist, most recently at Motel Morris restaurant in Chelsea. And I'm Rich Strayer, a sommelier at Blue Hill at Stone Barns in upstate New York in Coke and Tea Coke Hills. And uh, we're here today to share a few recipes with you. Uh, we're a husband and wife team, and together during this quarantine period, we've been teaching a lot of virtual mixology classes, giving wine tips to people. We find that people are really enjoying learning a new skill set at home and sort of upping their happy hour game. And we're super grateful for everyone who wants to hear from us because we need things to do. Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, today we've chosen to feature um, one cocktail and one zero proof cocktail or mocktail is a better word. Um, and basically we want to show you something simple that you can make at home. We're going to start off with a tiki cocktail. And I find that tiki cocktails can sometimes be a little intimidating because some of them have about 20 ingredients. Um, they have really complicated garnishes. Sometimes we think of them as being overly sweet as well. But in general, they're actually quite simple, some of them. And uh, the Jungle Bird in particular, the one I'm showing you today, has not too many ingredients. So um, the first thing you're going to want to do is find a dark rum. I'm using Hamilton rum, and that's aged for five years. It's a Demerara rum. So it's not quite as dark as something like maybe the Kraken that you'll see, which is more of a black spice rum. This is just going to have that beautiful golden caramely color to it. Um, and it's going to add a really lovely base note to the cocktail. So again, you're not going to want to use a white rum like a Bacardi, although that's fantastic in a mojito. And other cocktails are going to want to go for a dark rum. The other spirit I'm featuring in the Jungle Bird is Campari. So Campari, you're probably more familiar with in something like a Negroni, if you're a Negroni drinker. Also, it appears in a Boulevardier, which is a Negroni with bourbon. For those who haven't heard that before, that's a fun one to try. Um, so Campari is made in Italy. It's a bitter. So that adds a pretty unique spin to, tiki, uh, to a tiki cocktail. You don't see that in too many tiki drinks, actually. The other thing we're going to need is um, pineapple juice. If you have a juicer and you want to be really ambitious and make fresh pineapple juice, great. You can. Uh, you totally can. Otherwise, very realistic that uh, store-bought would be just fine and delicious in this. You're also going to want some fresh lime juice. Um, we're going to use that in both the cocktail and the zero-proof cocktail. So if you have one of those um, little lime citrus presses, that's a great way to make fresh juice. You can store it in the fridge. You'll use it for all sorts of things. And then you're also going to need a plain simple syrup. Rich, can you give a little uh, lesson on simple syrup? Yeah. Simple syrup is exactly that, a simple syrup. Com combination sugar, water in equal parts. Um, you can, you usually find that about a cup of water to a cup of sugar makes enough cocktail or enough syrup to make at least eight cocktails. Um, when you think about, you're only about going to use about an ounce or so of sugar syrup in a particular cocktail. And if you have eight people, you've got eight cocktails. But if you don't, it'll last you all week. Um, depending on how you want that drink to be, if you want a little more viscosity, you can use a little bit more sugar than water, and that'll give you a thicker, richer syrup. 
Um, you can also use things like raw cane sugar. It'll give you a darker color, but it'll also add complexity the same way that this rum does. Um, but it's a really great ingredient to have around, not only for your cocktails or mocktails, but for anything that you want to sweeten. It's really great to pour over cakes and other things. So it's a very useful ingredient to have. And also um, later, Rich will be featuring a basil simple syrup. So you want to talk about infusing herbs Absolutely. as well? Um, so here I'm going to be using this basil simple syrup. Um, it's exactly the same process. The only thing that you do is once your syrup comes to a boil, add a handful, good handful of whatever herb you choose. Uh, it can be something growing in your backyard. It can be something store-bought like mint, which goes a, a long way. Um, and throw that into your pot and let it cool down with that mixture, strain it out, and you have an incredibly infused spirit. And you can use anything that you want. You don't have to use herbs, you can use spices. Anything that you have in your pantry that you think would be delicious, use it, try it. If it doesn't work, make another batch. That's the great thing about simple syrup. It's cheap to make yep. and super easy. Yeah, and those are ingredients that you really, most people have them on hand in their pantry, sugar and tap water. So again, really, really easy, um, low stakes, nothing too yeah. crazy that we're getting into here. Um, and then I also want to have some fresh mint. Um, I, uh, you could do a very complicated garnish for a jungle bird. I know we see, like I said, we see tiki cocktails that have like a cherry and an orange and a flower and an umbrella. I'm not doing that today. I want to keep it really simple for you at home. So just the fresh mint. Um, so getting into the proportions right away for this, I'm going to do an ounce and a half of my rum. And I'm using a metal shaker. Anytime you're shaking a, a cocktail, it's usually because it has citrus juice in it. We shake things that have citrus so they get well incorporated. We stir things that are all spirit, like a Manhattan or a Negroni. Um, so I have an ounce and a half of the rum. And then I have pre-measured out into these little jars just to make my life a little easier, um, an ounce and a half of pineapple juice. We're doing three quarters of an ounce of Campari. So my jigger is one ounce on one side, half an ounce on the other. So I'll want to kind of measure that accordingly. Your jigger at home, if you have one, might be two ounces on one side, one ounce on the other. That's kind of a standard as well. And then I'm doing a half an ounce of lime juice and a half an ounce of simple syrup. All of that goes into my shaker. My top on there, and I'm gonna just shake this very vigorously. just do that for drama. I know it looks dramatic sometimes when you're at a bar and we're shaking for a long time, but we're really trying to get it super cold, really well incorporated, very well mixed. My um, shaker has a strainer built right in. If yours doesn't, you'll use a Hawthorne strainer, which is that handy tool right there. I'm using a footed tumbler glass. I like a clear glass so I can see the color of this drink. And I'm going to strain right into it. I'm going to use some ice to top it off. Perfect. Thank you, Rich. Again, uh, my ice goes in last because I don't want the drink to dilute too much. While we want a little dilution, we want a drink that comes out watery. So that's always something we're being aware of. And I'm going to take my mint sprigs, tuck them right into the side there, and voila, you have a jungle bird. So that is a classic drink invented in Kuala Lumpur at the Hyatt in the 1970s. That's the history behind it. And I hope you'll give it a try. Perfect for like an afternoon barbecue um, or in the evening. It actually makes a great after dinner drink too with the Campari bitter aspect in there. Great in place of coffee. <laughs> so um, perfect. So I'm going to pass it over to Rich who's going to do our zero proof cocktail. Yes. I love making the zero proof cocktails when we're asked to make them. Um, I, I think that there's a lot to be said for combining ingredients without alcohol to make something really, really delicious because there's a lot of things out there. Um, what we're using now are very summery ingredients, things that you can find almost year round, um, but we think of them particularly in the summer. Lime, pomegranate, making things fun at barbecues. Um, but please feel free, use what's seasonal to you. Um, if you can dream it, you can probably make it and make it taste good. Um, so. I encourage you to, to play around. So what I'm doing here is a mocktail or zero proof cocktail that we've made, named Manhattan Henge, named after that beautiful effect that happens and it's happening this weekend. This weekend. Um, where the sun aligns itself perfectly in the middle of all of the streets that run west to east as the sun sets and it creates this beautiful shadow effect on the buildings. So we're playing off of that shadow effect, shadow and light um, in this play on a New York sour, which is a classic cocktail that would incorporate usually some kind of whiskey, sour mix, which is 
lemon, lime juice, and sugar. Uh, and then that would be, instead of an egg white to give it that beautiful frothy top, you're using red wine to create this beautiful color separation. I'm not doing that. I'm gonna use lime juice, that basil simple syrup, a little bit of jalapeno, uh, and then pomegranate juice to top it off to give it that color separation. But do you want to talk a little bit about the jalapeno aspect? Yeah, absolutely. So we did something fun for this cocktail and when Rich first suggested it, I thought, hmm, interesting. I don't know how I'm gonna feel about it, but I actually really love it. So um, we made pickled jalapenos um, for the weekend. We were having fish tacos. For 4th of July. And that's always a great um, thing to add to tacos or burgers, pickled jalapenos. Some of you may have made that at home before if you haven't. You're gonna do um, a cup of white vinegar and half a cup of sugar. You bring that to a boil, and then you add um, rounds of jalapeno. You wanna slice them on the thinner side. Two jalapenos is probably a good amount for that proportion of vinegar and sugar. So once the vinegar and sugar has boiled, in go the jalapenos. You let the whole thing cool, transfer it to a mason jar, and store it in the fridge. Now what we're doing in the cocktail, which is something pretty different, we're actually using a little bit of the jalapeno brine. Yes, so that's what I have here, is that jalapeno brine, as we would call it. We don't have any salt in this particular brine, but you can add salt to it if you want, about a teaspoon or so, just to give it a little bit more of that saline quality. And it works beautifully in cocktails to give it like seasoning. You want things balanced and salt is one of those things that your tongue craves. So throw it in there, by all means. Um, and here, you're gonna get a little bit of spice from that. We left the membranes of the jalapenos in. You can cut them out and take the spice away, but leave the jalapeno flavor. Feel free to do what you wanna do. So I'm gonna build this cocktail out. I've measured things out here. So an ounce of lime juice, this is three quarters an ounce of basil simple syrup, and then a quarter ounce of that jalapeno brine right into my shaker here with ice. And the reason I, I love this, it's kind of like a shrub in that way. A shrub is a, a traditional cocktail that uses vinegar and sugar to make it, um, but it adds that complexity like as if alcohol were there. There's a fermentation that happens with vinegar, so it's already in place, but it's not alcoholic. Excuse me. <laughs> Almost lost her there. That's all right. So, so um, now what we're going to do. Yeah, we're using our... large ice cubes for this. Yes. So what I'm going to do is just grab one of those with my tongs here. As soon as they decide they want to stop swimming around on me. Pop that in. And then we'll strain that over our ice cube. This is a large ice cube. They make silicone molds for these kinds of ice cubes. So you can do them at home. You don't have to buy them from a crazy ice maker. And then I'm going to pour my ounce of pomegranate juice into this little two ounce measuring cup because it has a spout on it. And I wanna be able to control my stream when I pour this over the top so that we get maximum separation here. And you can see it start its little work there keeping that separation beautiful. And we'll hold that up to the camera so you can really see uh, the color separation here. So essentially what we're playing with, and Rich will explain, is viscosity. Yes, so you have liquids of different densities coming together, so one will float on top of the other. You have the simple syrup on the bottom keeping it separate, but you don't want to move it too much before you serve the cocktail because it can start to blend, which it's already starting to do. And then to garnish, I have these beautiful tops of Thai basil that are growing outside here. Um, the purple flower is on top, but then you have the beautiful green leaves. So there's that beautiful energy from green and then that purple to match the pomegranate. And then we put that right on the corner of our ice cube and we have a beautiful little summer zero proof cocktail. Really and pretty. Happy. And I think if you were to serve that um, to a friend who for whatever reason, lifestyle choice, health reasons doesn't, Imbibe alcohol, it's such a fun um, mocktail, such a fun zero proof cocktail, and yeah. it really feels very festive and special. And it's one of those things that because of the size of that ice cube, it dilutes slower, so it'll change over time the way that some of those really complex cocktails do in these beautiful cocktail bars we have around the country now. And it's lots of fun to drink. So much fun. So uh, it's been such a pleasure being here with all of you. Again, I'm Natasha Soto Albors. And I'm Rich Dreyer. And we're Violet and Vine of NY. We're on Instagram as at Violet and Vine of NY. If you want to reach out to us with cocktail questions, we're always happy to hear from people. You can snap a picture of your home bar and ask us for some advice on what you might make with what you have on hand. 
So again, thank you so much. We hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Yeah, cheers. Thank cheers. you guys. Thank you, Natasha and Rich, and thank you all for joining us today. Hope you have a great rest of your day.